Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, tonight's class is sponsored by Mrs. Sara Carmelli for the four Shlema for Sara Bas Miriam. We have a complete through four Shlema. Amen. Um, this week is it's Monday night, so it's Parsha. This week is Parsha's Truma, which deals basically with the uh, appliances of the Beis Migdash, the Ara and the Luch, the, the, the Shulchan, the Menorah, the walls of the Mishkan, the coverings of the Mishkan. Next week of Pashas, the Tzavid primarily talks about the garments of the high priest and the Koyanim, just the garments. But this week's Pasha, Hashem is commanding the Moshe Rabbeinu to do, you know, the uh, building of all the uh, appliances that we, they need in the Mishkan, the furniture, so to speak. But there's a very interesting thing. There's three opinions. We know it like this. Moshe Rabbeinu went up on Har Sinai, Hashem gave us the Torah. Then Moshe Rabbeinu went up for 40 days. He came down, the Jews broke the Lucha. The, he broke the Lucha because the Jews made the golden calf. He went up another 40 days to get forgiveness. Hashem still didn't forgive. He went up a third 40-day period. He came down on Yom Kippur. That's when Hashem said, I forgive the Jewish people. Okay? So the question over here is, when did Hashem tell Moshe Rabbeinu this parsha of building the kalim, the vessels of the base of the Mishkan? When did he tell it to them? So there's three opinions. According to the Zohar, okay, the commandment and the actual giving of the gold, silver, and copper was after Matan Torah before the Jews sinned in the golden calf. This is very interesting how it works technically. But after Matan Torah, before the Jewish people broke the uh, worship the golden calf, was meaning within that 40 days. The Medrash Tan Chuma, which is a Medrash, says that after Yom Kippur, when, when did Hashem command the Jews to build the Mishkan was after Yom Kippur. Not like the Zohar that says it was before the golden calf. Okay. According to the Medrash Tan Chuma, it's after Yom Kippur, after Hashem forgave the Jewish people. Then there's Ramban brings down a Medrash that says, no, the commandment was before the golden calf. And the giving was after the golden calf. Okay. So one opinion, the Zohar says everything was before the golden calf. According to Medrash Tan Chuma, everything was after the golden calf. And according to the Ramban, it was in the middle of the golden calf. Hashem commanded them to give it, and then they were, and then they were still giving it. Okay. What is what do these things reflect? Because when there's three opinions, I know there's two Jews, three opinions, but when in a Torah there's different opinions, it doesn't mean stam different opinions. Each opinion is Torah. That means each opinion is teaching us something in living, in how to live like a Jew, even though the halacha may not even be like one of the opinions. But the fact that Torah tells us there is such an opinion, whatever it is in Torah, <clears throat> that means there is a lesson that we need to learn from this. So the Rebbe explains these three opinions before the eagle, after the eagle, in middle of the eagle, represents three different types of Jews. Before the golden calf, what were the Jews? They were a level of a tzaddik. They didn't sin. They just got the Torah. Brand new, you no, know, brand new uh, mitzvahs, everything brand new. They were mamish tzaddikim. If you hold, it was after the golden, after Yom Kippur. That means then the Jews were in a level of Bali Tshuva. They were Bali Tshuva. They, they, Hashem forgave them in Yom Kippur. So now they built the Mishka. So then they're Bali Tshuva. If you hold like the Ramban, the commandment was before the eagle and the giving was after the eagle, that means it was during the eagle time, during the golden calf. Which means at that time, the Jews were still a Russia. They're still wicked. They're in the middle of worshiping the golden calf. So the Rebbe explains, what does this mean? It means any type of Jew, if you're a tzaddik, 
or a Russia or a Bautshuva, okay? Whatever it is, you are obligated to build the Mishkan for Hashem. What does this mean? A tzaddik could think, a tzaddik could think, I mean, if he knows who he is, without haughty and ego and haughtiness and all that. A tzaddik says, listen, I'm a holy person. I'm a Shirabeinu. Why do I need to build a Mishkan? I'm a, self, <laughs> I'm a self-made Mishkan. I'm a home for God just within myself. What do I need to build God a home for? The Torah says you still need to build a home for Hashem. Not only for you, but for everybody else too, including yourself. Another person could come along and say, I'm a Russia. I'm middle of the ego. Like we said, the Ramban said, the commandment and the giving, it was all in the middle of the ego. And you can say, I am so bad. How in the world can I build a home for Hashem? How could I build a Mishkan for Hashem? And then you have the Baal Tshuva. The Baal Tshuva says, I'm even greater than a tzaddik. If I'm greater than a tzaddik, why do I need to build a Mishkan? The bottom line is, Hashem says to every single Jew, because the Pasik at the beginning of the parasha says, the famous Pasik, Ba'asuli Migdosh, in the eighth Pasik, Ba'asuli Migdosh, the Shachanti Besecham. Make for me a dwelling place, and I will dwell in their midst. It should have said, in its midst. So the Shalah Kodesh, the Reshaz Chochma, a lot of the commentaries explain. What is the Pasik teaching us here? B'seicham meaning Hashem is speaking to every single Jew. Every single Jew needs to make for himself a mishkan. B'shochanti b'seicham, I will dwell in their midst, in the midst of every single Jew. So not only, the Rebbe explains that this referring to the three different types of Jews. The Tzadik Jew needs to build, the Rosh Jew needs to build a mishkan, the Baal Jew needs to build them, everybody needs to build a mishkan. But it's not only three different types of people. Within each one of us, you think about it, sometimes we're on a tzaddik level, sometimes we're on a Russia level, sometimes we're about Shuva level. It depends on our moods. You know, we're very moody. Sometimes we could be good, sometimes we could be sinful, sometimes we could be doing Shuva, whatever. A Jew should never think there's a time in his life because of his behavior that he or she cannot build a Mishkan for Hashem. Every single Jew has the ability and therefore the responsibility and the mitzvah to build a Mishkan no matter who you are. So these three opinions, the Zayu says it was after Matan Torah, before the Egel, meaning the Jews were tzaddikim, you have to build a Mishkan. The Tanchuma that says it was after Yom Kippur, meaning Bali Tshuva, you still have to build a Mishkan. And then even the Ramban who says it was in between, even a Russian needs to build a Mishkan. No matter what the Jew is, they have to build a Mishkan. And this explains another interesting thing. There are 13 or 15 is an argument in, in the count of all the gifts that they were brought, told to bring. But the first three things, the materials that the Jews were commanded to bring, the Torah said, this is the uplifting I should take whom etam that you should take for him from them, Zahab, Chasef, and Luchesh. Gold, silver, and copper. Then the Torah goes into purple wool, the different uh, various wool, various goat skins, and, and so on. Now, there's three materials here: gold, silver, and copper. Okay, or bronze. By the way, that's where you have in, in sports. You get the gold, and you get the silver, and then you get the bronze. These are the three things of gold, silver, and copper that the Mishkan was built with. But gold and silver, I can understand. I can understand why Hashem told us to bring it. In the Gemara Bar Metziah, there's an argument. It's a very interesting argument. What is better, gold or silver? What's a better material? So the Gemara has two different opinions. One opinion says gold is better. Why is gold better? Because it's more valuable than silver. Another opinion says no, silver is better. Why is silver preferred? Because silver is currency. 
You want to buy something, you can't buy with a piece of gold. I mean, it's too expensive. You buy it with silver, so it's currency. It's something that goes in business from hand to hand. So therefore, there's an argument in the Gemara, what is better, gold or silver? But so I understand gold and silver are good materials. Copper is a much cheaper material. There is a rule in the Beis Migdosh, in the Mishkan, in the Beis Migdosh. The Gemara says that before the animal was slaughtered as a carbon, the animal was given water to drink. Okay, it was given water to drink. Why? In case there are certain things stuck in the throat, when they slaughtered the animal, it shouldn't uh, disqualify the shechita. You know what I mean? It shouldn't disqualify the slaughtering. So the Gemara says, the animals in the base of were given to drink from golden utensils. Golden utensils for the animals to drink. So the Gemara asks, why did the animals have to drink from golden utensils? <clears throat> so the Gemara says a very beautiful rule. Ein anios mashiris. There is no poverty in the place of wealth. God's home is wealthy. In God's home, everything is top class, top notch. So therefore, even the animals would drink from golden utensils. <clears throat> so the question is now becomes stronger. Why was copper used in building of the Mishka? Gold and silver, we explained, is an argument which one's better. But copper, nobody says it's a better material. So why in the world did Hashem say to build it, for, to also give copper? And the Rebbe explains again a very beautiful concept, and this connects to something else also. Zav, Kesev, and Cheshev, it says in Chesidus in Kabbalah, represents Bali Tshuva, Tzadikim, and sinners. We just mentioned the three opinions about building the Mishkan. Gold, silver, and copper represents Bali Tshuva, Tzadik, and sinner. What does that mean? <clears throat> Gold is a reddish type of material. So it has a reddish tint to it. Red, as the Patsik says, <speaking in Hebrew> if your sins will be red like thread, Kashalag Yalbino Hashem went through you, but will whiten it. Sins represent, many times in Torah, sins represent red. Red is a sign of blood. Red is a sign of Gvura. Sins are severity. Gold, red, is basically a bad color. <clears throat> but gold is a very good, <laughs> it's expensive reddish tint. So Chassidus and Kabbalah explain that refers to a Balchuva. He had the, the life of sin, but he transformed it into very good quality, very good material. He transformed it into gold. Kesef, silver, represents the tzaddik. Why is silver representing the tzaddik? Number one, silver is it's, it's gray, but it's a whitish, you know, compared to gold, it's more whitish, which represents, again, purity. And not only that, Chassidus explains, the word kesef in Hebrew comes from the word Nirsef Nirsafti. We're seeing it in Yedid Nefesh. Nirsef Nirsafti is longing, a yearning, a longing. So it says in Chsidis that Kesef represents the Tzadik. Nucheshes is red, so to speak, like gold. But what's wrong with Nucheshes? The root of Nucheshes, copper, is Nochash, the snake, which represents original sin. So Zav, Kesev, and Nechashis represents, again, the three different types of people. Zav represents the Balchuva, Kesev represents the Tzadik, and Nechashis represents the Rosha. 
What does Hashem say? I want every single type of Jew, not only in the time of the commandment of the Mishkan, but the materials. I want the Tzaddik material. I want the Russian material. I want the Balchuva material. I want all the various different types of materials. But we could take this a step further. <clears throat> we mentioned before, there's an argument in the Gemara, in Bab Metzia, what is better, gold or silver? In the Gemara Brachas, there's another argument. Who is better, a tzaddik or a bal tshuva? There's an argument in the Gemara. Who is holier, a tzaddik or a bal tshuva? The Rambam rules that a bal tshuva is greater. But there's an opinion in the Gemara, and in fact, many codifiers ask on the Rambam, according to the laws of the Talmud, the law should have been that a tzaddik is greater, with whatever. But there's two opinions in the Gemara, who is greater, a tzaddik or a Balchuva. There's two opinions in the Gemara, who's better, gold and silver. It's the same argument, really. Silver represents the tzaddik, gold represents the Balchuva. So now the question is, who's better, gold or silver, a Balchuva or a tzaddik? It's the same argument, really. But when it comes to building the Mishkan, <clears throat> Hashem says whether you're a tzaddik, a Balchuva, a Russia, Even the Rasha, Hashem says you have to build a Mishkan for me. You have to build a home for me. Another interesting thing, the Pratik says like this, the beginning of the Parsha. Dabir al Bnei Yisrael, speak to the Jews, the Yikhuli Truma. They should take from me a Truma. Why doesn't the Pratik say the uh, Yitnuli Truma? We should say the Dabar of Bnei Yisrael, the Yitnu Li Truma. They should give a Truma. The Yikhuni means you're taking. Why are you taking? They're giving. You're not taking it. Why does the Torah say, before you ask this question, by the way, why doesn't it say the Yitnu Li Truma? Okay. Uh, many times the Kisisa. You know, the box is hashekel. Why over here does it say the Yichuli Truma? So it's interesting. The Yichuli, the taking, is also a mitzvah. And here's a remarkable concept. Hashem set up the world. Okay, Hashem set up in the world. The world, in a way, there are givers and there are receivers. The whole system of the world is made in givers and receivers. Husbands give the seed, the wife receives the seed. Parents give, the children receive. Bosses give, the workers receive. Anything in life you have, the whole world is set up givers and receivers. Any aspect of life, you give and you take. Givers and receivers. Because in in the mind and the spiritual realms, there is the concept of giving and taking. Now, why Hashem made, by the way, certain people to be givers and certain people to be on the receiving end, like tzedakah or whatever else it may be, that's Hashem's business. But the Gemara says an interesting statement. It says, Yaisa mimasha balabayas oisa im ha'ani ha'ani oisa im balabayas. More than the giver does for the poor man, the poor man does more for the rich man. When the rich man gives, relatively speaking, the rich man gives the poor man tzedakah. Okay, so you would think the rich man is doing more for the poor man than the poor man is doing for the rich. Comes along the Gemara and says, No, more than what the owner is doing with the poor man, 
the poor man is doing with the rich man. Why? It's very simple. The giver of tzedakah gave a dollar. Whatever. The receiver is allowing the giver to do a mitzvah, which is invaluable. There's no value on a mitzvah. Hashem set up the world in a way of giver and taker. And Hashem says now building the Mishkan, the internal base of Migros that every Jew builds for God's home. The Torah is saying taking the Yikhuli Truma. The Torah says, I wanted to know the taker, the receiver. Don't feel bad because God is commanding you to take the Yikhu. God is commanding you to take. And therefore, don't feel depressed. Don't feel down and out. The bottom line is you are doing more for the giver than the giver is doing for you. That's a remarkable concept, by the way. And therefore, when it comes to building the Mishkan, the Torah doesn't say the Yitnu Li Truma. They should give truma. The Torah wants to emphasize sometimes taking is better than giving because you're allowing the person to do a very important mitzvah. Then there's another thing also with the v'yikhuli truma. The v'yikhuli truma, we mentioned this a number of times. Any person that knows simple Hebrew grammar, this passage, v'yikhuli truma, is grammatically incorrect. If you translate this pasuk simple, it means like this: sounds like a yeshiva brach's English. Take me truma. The yichu take me li means me. The Torah should have said the yichu a lie truma. The yichu aburi truma. Take for me. Upon me. The Torah says, take me truma. The Yikhuli Truma. What do you mean, take me Truma? So the Zerah says a remarkable concept. The word Truma is two words. The word Truma, if you switch the letters, is Torah Mem. The title which was given in 40 days. Truma is Torah Mem. It's very simple. Truma is the word title with an extra Mem. That refers to Matan Torah that was given in 40 days. Now, there have Tanya quotes from the Zayar that the Zayar says, What do you mean, Vigit Kuli Truma? The Zayar says like this When you learn Truma, when, I'm sorry, when you learn Torah, you are taking me. You are connected completely to me. You are one with me completely. And that's why it says the Yikhuli Dal Trebi is close to Zara. I see Atem Laikim. You are taking me. It's not the Torah not telling you take from me a truma. The Torah says when you have truma, Torah Mem, when you learn Torah, the Yikhuli, you are taking me. How could that be that you're taking Hashem? Number one, Torah is the wisdom of Hashem. Hashem and his wisdom are one. Okay? Now, what happens when a person studies Torah? If you remember when we were learning Tanya Wednesday night, a long time ago, we we're learning in Parake. In Parake of Tanya, Dal Rebbe speaks about the uniqueness of learning Torah over any other mitzvah. Okay, and to give you a simple example of this, here's a cup of water. The water is in the cup. The cup is not in the water. Okay, so this is a one-way unity. The water is in the cup, but the cup is not in the water. When I do a mitzvah, I'm connecting myself to that particular mitzvah of Hashem. Learning is unique. When a person learns Torah, or anything for that matter, when you learn science, math, geography, whatever, you have the knowledge in your head, right? So now you're absorbing the knowledge is in your head. 
your head is encompassing the, the, the knowledge. But while you're learning science, you can't learn math because your head is in the subject matter. Your head's in the science, you can't learn math. If your head is the math, you can't learn science. Which means an interesting thing. When I study math, okay, the math is in my head. And at the same time, simultaneously, my head is in the math and therefore I cannot learn anything else. Now let's exchange math for Tata, which is synonymous with Hashem. Hashem and his Tata are one. That means when a person studies Tata, God's wisdom, he has one which is synonymous with Hashem. Hashem's intellect is in my head, and my head is in the godliness. That unity cannot exist anywhere else in the world. Dalteb said, "There's such a yichud." In it, it can't be found in a physical analogy. It just doesn't exist. If A is in B, B is not in A. For A to be in B and to be in A can only be by, by learning. And by Torah means the unity is with Hashem. So that's what the Zayr says. The Yechuli Truma. The Torah is not telling us take for me. Yeah, that's what it means also. But the Torah, by using this expression, is teaching us something deeper. The Yikuli Truma, when you learn Torah Mem, Torah which was given in 40 days, I see Atam, you're taking me, you're Mamish becoming one with me. And that's the prerequisite for building the Mishkan of Hashem. A home has to have Torah learning because that's the foundation of, of the mitzvahs. And we'll see if we have time, we'll discuss more about that uh, later on. Okay, now the Mishkan. Was like this. There was the floor of the Mishkan. We discussed this a while ago. The floor of the Mishkan, earth, is inanimate. Then the boards of the Mishkan were made out of wood, like the Kroshim. That was plant life. What covered the Mishkan and covered the walls? The goat skins, which came from animal skin. Okay? Which means like this. On top, was animal, the highest of the three, right? Inanimate plant and animal. The highest is goat animal, so that was on top of the Mishkan. The walls of the Mishkan, that is plant life, that's second. The earth of the Mishkan was inanimate. Therefore, when a person brought carbonus in the Mishkan, you know, whatever it was, they, the person, had the inanimate plant and animal, so there are all parts of the world were connected to Hashem. It says, it says in, in Midrashim and Kabbalah and Chassidus that when a person brought an animal as a sacrifice, it didn't only elevate that particular animal. All the animals in the world were, were elevated to Kedusha, to holiness, with, with this particular animal being brought as a sacrifice. When they brought a flower offering, or whatever it was. All the plants, all the inner, everything was elevated. Now that was in the Mishkan. In the base of Migdosh stone, it was only made out of stone. There was no wood in the base of Migdosh. There was no animal skins in the base of Migdosh. The whole temple, the permanent base of Migdosh of, of the Jews was made out of stone. Which is interesting because stone is inanimate. That means the base of Migdash was right. only made out of inanimate. The walls of the Mishkan of the base of Migdash were not. The covering of the Mish base of Migdash was not. The Mishkan was. Base of Migdash was only made out of stone, which is completely inanimate. What's the difference? 
The base of Migdosh was much holier than the Mishkan was. It's understood. It was a permanent home of Hashem. The Mishkan was a temporary, you know, traveling uh, Mishkan, traveling the uh, home of Hashem. Beis Hamikdash was much holier. Many dinim applied that while the Mishkan was existing, Jews were able to make altars, bummies they were called, platforms, and bring a carbon wherever they wanted. They didn't have to bring it only to the Mishkan. Once the Beis Hamikdash was built, it had to be only in the base of Midrash. They were not allowed to bring any sacrifices anywhere else. If somebody did, they were obligated to get killed. They were not allowed. Why is it that the base of Midrash, which is so holy, was made out of inanimate only stone, and everything else was made out of inanimate plant animals? But the answer is this exactly is the point. Because the base of Midrash, was so holy, it permeated even the inanimate. Even the inanimate was. And it's interesting. In the Mishkan, they didn't build the floor of the Mishkan. It was the dirt of the Mishkan in the desert. When they picked up the, the Mishkan, they moved somewhere else. So that was different earth. The Mishkan was not as holy as the temple. And therefore, everything had to go systematic. What do you mean systematic? In this world, in this world, there's higher and there's lower. There's animal on top, then plant, and then inanimate. The base of Migdosh was so holy that the holiness of the base of Migdosh as we'll soon discuss, the uniqueness of it, was that it permeated everything. Even stone was completely, the walls, even inanimate was totally permeated by the Kedusha of the Beis Amigdash. And over there, there's no different levels, inanimate plant, animal. It was inanimate because the Kedusha permeated even to the inanimate, everything was holy. What was the uniqueness of the base of Migdosh and where did we see openly this level of Kedusha? So this week's Pasha speaks about building the Oren, the Ark for the Luches, right, for the, for the tablets. The broken tablets, the complete tablets were in the Ark. So the question is like this. The Holy of Holies, in the, not in the Mishkan, in the base of Migdosh, was 20 cubits long. I mean, we're wide. 20 cubits wide. The ark, as we see the dimensions in this week's parsha, were two and a half amas cubits wide. The room was 20 cubits. The ark was two and a half cubits. If you measured the room, it was 20 cubits. If you measured from the end of the ark to the room was 10, from the opposite end of the ark to the end of the room was 10, and the ark took up two and a half, that means in the base of Migdosh, 10 plus 10 plus two and a half equals 20. And it wasn't because they didn't know how to do math. In other words, what happened in the Beis Hamikdash? There was definitive space, ten and ten, and the room was twenty, and the ark took up two and a half. And yet, ten plus ten was plus two and a half is twenty. What does that mean? In the Beis Hamikdash, was such a revelation of godliness which was above time and time simultaneously. It was above measurements in measurements. There were measurements, 10 and 10 and two and a half, yet it equaled 20 because in measurements was a revelation of higher than measurements. And this is really a Pasuk and Tilim. The Pasuk says, Va'atahu, you are God. 
Ushneisacha, your years, lo yitam will never end. Anybody that knows minimal math knows you can't have infinite amount of finites. Because take away one finite, it's automatically less, but you can't have infinite minus one. So if you have years, time, you can't have infinite years. Yet the Pasuk says, Ba'atuhu, Abraham Malach says, You are God. Your years, your time is timeless. Lo Yutom will never end. That means time is timeless. Or in the base of Middash, place was placeless. It took up two and a half, but it didn't. That revelation in the base of Middash was so great, it permeated the stones too. There wasn't the thing. In other words, like it says in Chassidus, that refers to the era of Mashiach, where the source of everything will be revealed. And we're going to see the way inanimate is really higher than plant and human and everything else. Because the lower the thing, the higher the source. It comes down lower. So this is the uniqueness of the base of Migdosh over the Mishkan. So the Mishkan was built from inanimate plant and animal. And not only that, animal on top, then plant, then inanimate. Because that deals with the world we live in today. The other one, though, the base of Migdash was stoned, only inanimate, and it was above time and place, which is a much greater level. This answers another question. We're talking about building the Mishkan, which the, the Torah calls it Migdash, the Mishkan, Migdash, the Mar says it's all the same thing. The Pasik says in Malachim, when Shlema Melech, Built and finished building the base of Migdash. It was on that David Amal wanted to build it. Hashem said to him, You shed blood, you were fought battles, you cannot, you know, build the base of Migdash. Shleim Amalach, that means Sholem. There was no wars in the days of Shleim Amalach. Shleim Amalach was friendly with everybody. No wars. He's going to build the base of Migdash. So, what is it? When Shleim Amalach finished building the base of Migdash, there's a Pasik in Malach and Shleim HaMelech says that he's wondering. HaShemayim Ushmei HaShemayim Lo Yichal Kolucha Ba'av Ki Abayi Sazeh What does Shleim HaMelech ask? The heavens and all the everything of the heavens meaning the vast universe is not big enough for you is not big enough for you and this building will be big enough for you. Shalom HaMelech is asking a very simple question. What do you mean God's home? How can you have a God home if the universe is not big enough for Hashem? This little basin, which wasn't a massive building, by the way. I mean, it was big. It wasn't a massive building. There are much bigger building centers. There are much bigger Jewish centers today in the world. Than the base of Migdash was size wise. The question is, how could it be? So, what's the answer? How Taka could it be? This is the power of the Jew of the Asali Migdash Veshachanki Besecha. Made for me a Migdash, Hashem says, You, the Jew, have to make for me the base of Migdash, and then I will dwell in its midst. Meaning like this. When a Jew does a mitzvah, especially when it's difficult to do a mitzvah, a mitzvah that's easy to do, we learned already, it's not a big deal. I mean, yeah, you did a mitzvah. But it's not called avayda. It's not called work. If you enjoy it, it's not called work. It's not a yoke. When a Jew does a mitzvah, and the more they... I don't know if you would dislike doing it or hate doing it or, or it's uncomfortable doing it. Let's put it that way. The greater the mitzvah is in creating a home for God and earth. How do we create a home for the essence of God? 
we just mentioned that the base of Migdash took time and made it timeless. Place and made it placeless. Right? The Arden took up two and a half, but it, it didn't measure. Hashem took time. God, you are infinite. You are your, your essence. And your years, your years never end, meaning time is timeless. That is accomplished when a Jew does one little mitzvah. Or one mitzvah, big mitzvah. Doesn't matter. What does a Jew do when he does a mitzvah? They're taking a finite object. And even, by the way, if it's a verbal mitzvah, you're taking your physical mouth. If it's a thinking mitzvah, then you're taking your physical brain. It doesn't matter. When a Jew takes a limited physical object, or we have time mitzvahs, Shabbos, Yom Tif, Yom Kippur, the mitzvah is time. Counting the Omer, the mitzvah is counting time. That's the mitzvah. There's no object. <clears throat> the mitzvah is the time. When a Jew takes a limited physical object or a limited time and they bring God into that time or into that place, they are actually accomplishing making time timeless and place placeless. So when Shlema Melech asked the question, if the heaven and the world is not great enough to hold you, how can this, how, how, how can this house do it? The answer is because the ark didn't take up any place. Meaning, the physical, what was the uniqueness of the ark not taking up any place? The Torah is telling us when it comes to revelation of God, home of God that each one of us makes every time we do a mitzvah, Hashem is saying, you are making your limited place, placeless. You're making your time timeless. And therefore, granted, the physical universe, which is still physical, limited, cannot hold Hashem, but the Jew, by serving Hashem, can. Because you're taking the infinite God, putting it into a finite place. Find an object, to find a place, find a person, whatever it may be. And that is the uniqueness of how a Jew builds a Mishkan, a Migdash for Hashem. But also the Migdash for Shachanti, the Seichem, and I don't want to go into it now, but it's going to take too long, and we, and we really learned a bunch of the stuff already. The, in the Maimar and Basi Lagani, he says, you take an animal, he refers to the individual animal, the personal animal, you bring it up as a sacrifice, the various different methods and parts of bringing up the sacrifice. This is what connects the Jew Hashem. And that's the uniqueness of what we're able to do. Okay, another important thing. There are three uh, particular gifts. The three times the Torah speaks about the giving the half a shekel. <clears throat> there were the the <clears throat> Rashi quotes the three things. One was the sockets, the adonim, okay, that held up the boards of the Mishkan. The boards were big, heavy boards, ten amas high, fifteen feet high. They were put into sockets made of silver. Where did they get that silver from? That was from, uh, like the, 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 the Yushalmi says, Trumas um, Adonim, Tichos Trumas Shkolim, and the Trumas Hamishka, meaning like this. The Jews gave, in fact, Erev, and Erev Purim, we give three, Masas a shekel, we give three, because yeah. the term mentions about three half shekels. One of them was used as the sockets that held up the boards, silver sockets that held up the boards. Of the of the Mishkan. Second one was the boards, and the third one was the covering of the Mishkan. Now, 
What is the foundation of everything? The foundation of everything was a half a shekel. That was the foundation held up the board, right? That was the foundation that held up the Mishkan. In that respect, the Jews were all equal. Okay? The Adonim and the Karbonis were half a shekel. The other gifts that people gave for other, you know, things in the base of Migdosh, in the Mishkan. You were rich, you gave more. You were poor, you gave less. These two half a shekels for the sockets and for the korbanis, that every Jew should be a part of the korbanis. Then the Torah says, everybody is equal. Everybody is equal. What does this mean in the practical sense? It means like this. We said before, there are Jews that are tzaddik, rasha, palchuva, whatever. Different levels of Jews. When it comes to the foundation of the Mishkan, the Torah says, I don't want rich people giving more and poor people giving less. Because then this guy will say, you see, I held up the Mishkan. I am the one that holds up God's home. God, Hashem says, every Jew is equal in the construction of the Mishkan. My home is from everybody. From the gold, from the silver, and even the copper, which is Nochash, the snake, the original sin. Hashem says, I want that every single Jew is equal when it comes to sacrifices. No person can say there are more, you know, I'm better, I'm more part of God than God's home than you are. The foundation is equal by everybody. The sacrifices are equal by everybody. Hashem basically says, you know something? Compared to me, if Hashem really wants to be honest, you know, Hashem is just a nice guy. Hashem wants to be honest. Hashem can say, listen guys, let me tell you something. The biggest guy and the worst guy compared to me are all the same. I'm infinite. You guys are finite. So it's a trillion and one. This guy's a super great tzaddik. He's a trillion. This guy's a big rush. He's one. You know something? Compared to me, you're all the same. I'm infinite. You're all worthless to me. Hashem doesn't say you're all worthless to me. Hashem says the opposite. You are all worth equally to me. I want you each one to give a half a shekel. The rich cannot give more. The poor cannot give less. When it came to the Karbonis, the half a shekel that the Torah speaks about in Kisisan, the half a shekel, that half a shekel was also for every single person to be equal in the foundation of the Mishka and the foundation of Judaism. God rests equally on everybody. The Sefer Samad, which was Elishan, says that Hashem and the Rebbe quoted this when he came out with the Tefillin campaign before the Six Day War. The Smag says, Hashem, listen to this expression, says, Hashem has more enjoyment when a Russia puts on Tefillin more than when a Tzaddik puts on Tefillin. Imagine. Hashem says, when the Russia does something for me, I appreciate it much more than when the Tzaddik does it. Why? Because it's something new. It's something unique for him. And this is the same thing. And we find a similar vein. You know, when you have a common denominator, it's an interesting thing. Hashem told Meshia Bain in this week's parsha to build the Menera. Okay? By Shlishi. Well, see some Menera is all And you have to make it out of one solid piece, a block of wood, and um, you know, all these uh, the Caleb. Okay, and Rashi says at the end, Meshe Rabbeinu didn't know how to build this menorah. Okay, until Hashem showed him a fiery menorah and said, this is what you build. Another Medrash says, Hashem told Meshe Rabbeinu originally, take the block of gold, throw it into the fire, and out came a menorah. So it says, Meshe Rabbeinu didn't get 
his old menorah concept. What was Meisha Rabbeinu's problem? What was the problem with the Menorah? So there's a number of issues. Number one, Meisha didn't understand how can a Menorah be illuminating, you know, the world. You know, it's a physical thing. How can you physically do physical things? But there's another concept with Meisha Rabbeinu didn't understand the Menorah. And again, this is the same common denominator of what we've spoken a number of things tonight. There are seven branches on the menorah. Hanukkah is eight, right? But the menorah and the Beit HaMikdash have seven branches. It says in Psukim and Medrashim, this represents seven seven types of Jews. Seven candles represent the seven emotional attributes it represents the seven different types of Jews. Aaron Akrayan lit the Menorah. He lit the Menorah. And the Torah says, wow, he was so great. In the Baruch Shibbalah, when it says that he lit the Menorah, it says, Kain also, Lahagid Shivachay Shal Aaron, to tell us, look how great Aaron was, that he did it correctly. You know, when he lit the menorah, he did it right. You know how many women light Shabbos candles every week and they do it right? I mean, come on. He took a fire from the Mizbeach. And there's, you see, what's the big deal lighting the menorah? Come on. Again, even, even little girls like the Shabbos menorah. Even, even men <laughs> like the Hanukkah menorah, they usually do it right. What's the big deal that Aaron and Akrain lit the menorah? The menorah is a whole different ballgame. The Meneida is kindling every single different type of Jew. Kindling every single, from the highest to the lowest. The best to the worst. Meish Rabbeinu didn't understand. Meish Rabbeinu couldn't understand. How could that be? How could you, one person light every possible unique type of a Jew? From the best to the worst, from the biggest to the smallest. How could that be? So Hashem answered Meshe Ben with two things. Number one, the Menaida was unique. It wasn't piecework. They didn't make different things and solder it together. The Menaida was one big block of gold, miksha, it was one kika, it was a kika. Okay? And it was a large amount of gold, and they had to take a hammer and bang it out from this one piece of gold into the, all the intricate designs of the menorah. If you ever see a picture of the menorah, there's a lot of intricate designs. And they had to bang it out out of one piece of gold. Why couldn't Hashem tell them to do it piecework? You know, people do it today. You, ne you can never tell that it was the piecework. Right, they had they were so brilliant. They wove clothing, Rashi says, while the wool was still on top of the goat or the sheep. While the wool was still on top of the sheep, Tovumino Ezim, it says by the way, the goats. They wove it while it was still on the goat. You know, brilliant. They had such craftsmen in those days, it was unbelievable. Why couldn't why did Hashem tell them to do it like this? Because Hashem is telling Meshach Rabbeinu, in essence, all the Jews are one piece of gold. We're all the same. It's just when you bang them out, you know, when they get out there, then you have different levels. You have seven different levels. But in essence, in essence, they're all the original the same. Meshach Rabbeinu is not more Jewish than me and you. I'm as Jewish as Meish Rabbeinu. Everybody in the world is e the Jewish is equally Jewish. The same Jew as Meish Rabbeinu. It's not Meish Rabbeinu wasn't more Jewish. He was greater. He was more observant. He was holier. But he's not more Jewish. Meish Rabbeinu had a problem with two. How can in the world can you light up seven people? All different types of Jews. 
And therefore Hashem told them, they're all the same thing. They all come from the same place. And Meshach Rabbeinu still didn't understand it. So what did Hashem do? He showed him a matbeah shal eish. I mean, not matbeah. I mean, um, a menorah of eish. Or he threw the menorah into the fire and out came the, you know, the gold into the menorah and out came the, the menorah. Or the like Rashi says in this week's parasha, uh, Hashem showed him a fiery menorah and show, why did Hashem show him a fiery menorah? Why didn't Hashem show him a golden menorah? So you will see this? This is what you should make. Why show him a fiery menorah? Hashem is telling Meshach Rabbeinu, every single Jew has a fire of the Neshama within them. Illuminating the Jew is not something that's out of the ordinary. It's not something that you must create anew. It is every single Jew, number one, we all come from the same place. All Nishamas come from the same place. Not only that, the kindling of the Neda is because every Jew is a Neda Shalish. Every Jew has a Neshama. That's so Ned Hashem Nishmas Adam, Shlema Malach said. The candle of God is the soul of man. <clears throat> that is the uniqueness of the neshama. And this was the greatness of Aaron. When me and you, you and I correctly, light the Shabbos candles, Hanukkah candles, yeah, we'll take a match, light it, and big deal. Aaron Akrain understood what he's doing here. He's not lighting seven candles. He's lighting, when he lit one candle, he's lit lighting all the Jews of that caliber. Next, of Jews of that nature, of this at this level. You know what type of Aveda that is? He understood what he was doing. And yet, his greatness was he was still able to accomplish it. Without messing it up. Without his hand shaking and trembling or whatever. He did it right. That was his greatness. This is the uniqueness of the Menorah in this way that this is why Meshe Abedo couldn't understand it. And one last thing, the Medrash says why was there a Menorah in the Beis Amidus? Did God need light? Most places, the windows are made for light to come in. Not for light to go out, for light to come in. The windows in the base of Middle were made that the light should go out. And the Medrash says, why? When Aaron kindled the Menorah, it says, Simen hu l'chol boy elam, this was a sign to the entire world that the Shekhinah rests amongst the Jewish people. In whom does the Shekhinah rest? In the Zohav Jews, Kesev Jews, Nechashish Jews. Before the Egel, after the Egel, during the Egel. This is the home that every single Jew built for Hashem. Because every Jew is a menorah. Every Jew is a candle. Every Jew does one mitzvah. They make time timeless and they make place places. And this is the uniqueness of what the Mishkan was that every single Jew has. Okay, once again, tonight's class is sponsored by Mrs. Carmeli for the four shleim of the son of Bas Miriam. Uh, complete to the four. Amir uh, Wednesday night will be Haloch and Tanya at 8 o'clock. Want to wish the Gold family a Mazel Tov on the engagement of their daughter. They only have Simchas and Lebedic uh, healthy. We should all be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you so Amen. much, Rabbi. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you, Rabbi. thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.